Good afternoon, everyone. How exciting to hear the buzz in the room. We're so glad that you could join us here today for the inaugural New South Wales Higher Education Summit. This summit is hosted by the Scientia Education Academy. I am Nalini Patha, and my colleague in the front here is Patsy Polly. We are professors in medicine, and together we direct the Scientia Education Academy. We warmly welcome you to this event, and we have guests joining us here in the hall. We're really glad to see you, but we also have a number of people that are online with us today. We're so excited that we are actually joined by 30 universities and 20 other institutions today. And about a third of that is from people who are outside UNSW. We are especially grateful to our speakers and panelists who have generously agreed to offer their time, to offer their insights and their wisdom so that we th can think into this space today. Before we begin, though, I would like to acknowledge the Bejigal people who are the traditional custodians and the first educators of the unceded lands and waterways on which we gather today. We pay our respects to the elders past and present and extend our respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who may be present here today. One of the great opportunities we have today is to learn about the ways of being, doing, and knowing from the oldest living culture in the world. This beautiful artwork in the back is called Guru Wall. It is located at our lower campus, and I invite you to take a walk there and have a look at it. It was created in 2021 by Uncle Greg Sims in collaboration with other First Nations artists and elders. Our experience over the last few years can be summarized by a disruption of place. Place is important for us as people and as communities and also for us as educators and leaders to discuss and imagine the future. When Patsy and I thought about these, this event, our vision was really to create that space for thought leadership and discussion, to contemplate an exciting future and an opportunity to make changes that will impact education for a long time in the future. The future is here. This is your space to connect, to talk, and hopefully work together. We hope that this is the start of a conversation that will bear fruit for the future. So, you know, I have to do some housekeeping, so let me get over the housekeeping. So for those of you who don't know the space that we are in today, the bathrooms are in the foyer, and you can follow the directions just past the bar counter. In case there's an emergency, do not follow me. Follow any of the other staff that will give you guidance in that emergency. Today's talks are gonna be recorded, so if you registered for this uh, event, you will get a link to the talks. Our event organizers and some of the fellows, we are the hosts for you today, are, working, are wearing yellow lanyards. So if you're lost and you need anything, just go to one of the people with the, red, uh, with the yellow lanyards. So today's format is slightly different. I said, Patsy and I imagined the event in one way. We spoke to Professor Merlin Crosley, and he said, oh, wouldn't it be lovely to have a networking opportunity in the middle where people can talk and there'll be a buzz? And so that's the format we have. We have two keynote speakers who are hopefully gonna get us thinking about some key issues. We're gonna have a break, and the break is really, for us, the most important part where we get to talk and chat and connect with each other. This is your space to do that. And then after that, we have Four, five chairs, and the five chairs is because we have some really important leaders in higher education who we get to think together about some of the issues into the future. So enough for me, from me. Um, oh, there's one other thing I need, do need to tell you. We do have a Slido running today. If you are online, you'll see the Slido on the screen. If you're here in the room, you'll see that there is a QR code, which we all know how to use by now, on the tables in front of you, and so please join the Slido. You can use that to ask questions, and we will take questions after each talk. There's also some poll questions, so please do contribute to the poll, and we just want to gather your ideas around what do you think we should be talking about now and what do you think the future looks like. So without any further ado, I'm gonna introduce our first speaker, 
we are very fortunate to have with us today Professor Andrew Norton from the Australian National University to deliver the first keynote presentation. He's going to talk to us about the higher education sector in 2023 and give us that broad overview. Andrew is Professor in the Practice of Higher Education Policy at the Centre for Social Research and Methods at the Australian National University. Prior to joining ANU, he was the Higher Education Program Director at the Gatton Institute from 2011 to 2018. White at Grattan, he was a government-appointed co-reviewer of the demand-driven university funding system and also served as an expert panel advising the government on higher education reform, particularly on financial issues. We could think of no better person to give us that broad overview today on higher education. So Andrew, over to you. So thanks, Nalini, and thanks for inviting me here today. Whoops, I've gone too far already. See, it's gone to the end. You've seen the whole thing in advance. <laughs> there we go. No. It does need the slides. Which way am I going? That way. You've seen the whole show <laughs> all at start. <laughs> now yeah, yeah. So can you take in all this at very high speed? So now we're right. So I was asked to sort of speak about the context in 2023. Uh, a lot of my slides have historical material as well. Uh, that's partly because I spent a lot of time putting it all together. Uh, but also because if you look carefully at the slides, I'm not going to dwell on it due to time, uh, what you'll see is that even though some of what I'm going to say today is a bit negative about the short term, most of these slides show that we've been there before. And, Austra and Australian higher education has continually had setbacks and continually come back uh, bigger and better than ever. So I want to start with uh, enrolments. So you can see there's been huge increase in enrolments in Australia since the middle of the 20th century. Uh, in 2021, the bit over 1.6 million students. Uh, but due to the decline in internationals, there was actually a small drop on 2020. So that actually ended a growth run that had been run for nearly 70 years. So really quite an extraordinary period of growth and I think not many other sectors would have had such continual growth over a long period of time. Now as you'd expect, uh, despite population growth, this has led to increased participation in higher education. So you can see by the end of the 1960s, uh, with the opening of the College of Advanced Education along with the universities, we're up to about 10% of 19-year-olds at university. And so 19 is the modal age of being at university. Uh, but that has climbed steadily with a few pauses and uh, retreats along the way and has been around 40% in more recent times. So you can see a bit of a, a dip and then an increase right at the end there. Uh, I, there are some issues with the ABS population data, so it's possible it's not real, but for reasons I'll explain in a moment, I think it could be. Uh, and, that, and the spike is due to COVID. So there's possibly some softening of demand, at least in the short term. Now, still the largest category of student is Commonwealth supported students, most of whom are, domestic, or are undergraduates. Uh, despite the sector's claims of constant funding cuts and stagnation, this has in fact been financed by very large increases in uh, government money, and money the government is lending via hex help. But again, at the end of the chart, you can see a bit of a dip off. So this is partly not real in the sense that under the job ready graduates policy, uh, the previous government moved some funding from the Commonwealth grant scheme, relabeled other programs, but it's still getting to the universities. There's also some temporary COVID money uh, coming out of the system. So there's a spike and then a drop. But nevertheless, I think that drop is reflecting real things going on, one of which is soft demand, which I'm going to talk about more in a moment, uh, but also an important policy change during job-ready graduates. 
So as part of job ready graduates, the government took uh, a Deloitte Access Economic study of teaching and scholarship costs. I know many of you will be critical of this particular study, but that's what they used. Effectively decided that the average of these costs should be the new total funding rate, so Commonwealth plus student contribution. So some disciplines, including law, business and arts, in fact get small increases. Uh, but other disciplines, and some very large disciplines we've got on the screen, uh, did in fact get a cut in total funding. I think the reason for that was, if you just cost for teaching and scholarship, what you're doing is taking out some previous implied research money that was coming via the student funding program. This is important for something I want to say later on. And so this is going to start depressing total revenue uh, from those disciplines. Now this question of soft demand, I understand quite a few unis haven't filled all their places this year. All the data series I've got on this issue of demand from the school leaver cohort has defects in it, so none of them are perfect. But it does seem like from the middle of the 2010s, a slightly smaller share of year 12 students were applying for university in the next year. This coincides with the worst ever graduate employment outcomes uh, for graduates. I don't know if that's the explanation, but it would seem fairly plausible that uh, that is part of it. The absolute numbers, if you take 17, 18 and 19, which sort of takes into account some people may not apply immediately, but they might apply later on. Uh, the numbers don't actually start declining until a few years after that, that dip appears. But nevertheless, it does seem like that at the margins, we're seeing some drop off in demand. And the courses where the demand is falling tend to be arts and business related courses, where at a guess these are often courses done by the people who aren't quite sure exactly what they want to do. So maybe what we're seeing here is with less confidence in the labour market for new graduates, we're seeing a, a bit of a decline in the school leaver interest uh, in university. However, what we have offsetting that from the mid-2020s is the biggest birth cohort in Australia's history, the so-called Costello baby boom cohort. Uh, will start to arrive in the mid-2020s. I guess my view is that even if the participation rate drops a little bit, uh, the sheer increase in the number of young people will mean that demand will start to go up again. So that is probably some good news at least for the universities struggling to fill their load at this point, uh, there's probably another couple of years to wait before this starts uh, correcting it. Now, the big policy question, and the one that probably is one of my principal points of interest, is whether uh, the policy framework can accommodate all these students. Now, I've written a lot on my doubts about whether the job ready graduates policy can, in fact, achieve that. There's two reasons for that. One is that effectively the job-ready graduate strategy was to reduce the average Commonwealth contribution and effectively force universities to take more students for the same amount of money. But because there's a very wide range in Commonwealth contributions, to the extent the student load moves towards the more expensive fields, that will mean fewer student places can be delivered. The other big issue is that there is a bias to regional institutions in the so-called growth funding. So-called because it's growth from a lower base. But what we see in the census is that most of the population growth is not in the regions. It is, as you'd expect, uh, in the cities and particularly the outer suburbs of the big cities. And so we could have this issue because Australian students mostly don't move to study, that even if in theory the system as a whole uh, can accommodate them, these places won't be in the right locations and people will miss out because their local university can't take them. Now there is this big uh, universities accord underway uh, set up by Jason Clare, the education minister chaired by Mary O'Kane. Uh, their interim report I think will be released on 19th July so that's now fairly close. Uh, so fingers crossed they've got some ideas about how to deal with this and at least give us more certainty about what the system is likely to produce. It's also got a very broad range of other issues that's addressing. 
Now, I would be very surprised, given the politics of this, if the university's accord didn't come uh, with any additional funding. On the other hand, if you look back on history, there's a pretty clear cycle that, that's not me, <laughs> pretty clear cycle that typically, except for job ready graduates at the end, uh, the major policy reforms have at least been conceptualised in periods where the budget is in balance or surplus, and all the periods of stagnation or cuts have been when the budget is in deficit. And so even though there probably will be a little bit of a surplus uh, in the short term, uh, the budget forward estimates are forecasting deficits. So simply based on historical patterns, I would say this is not going to be a particularly favourable few years for higher education in trying to extract large amounts of money uh, from the Commonwealth. For postgraduate students, most of whom are full fee, uh, there is no cap on their numbers, there's no cap on how much can be borrowed under the fee help loan scheme. So there is, is a potential money maker aside from what the Commonwealth's decisions will be in any given budget. But the question is, is the demand going to be there? So we hear all these stories that you know, people are going to have five careers over their working lives and constantly need to retrain, etc., etc. But that's not what we're really seeing in the data except for a spike at the end, which I think is a counter-cyclical COVID-related event. What we saw through a lot of the 2010s was that the number of postgrad coursework students was fairly stable or increasing by a small amount, which is even more surprising when you consider the, the population of people eligible for such a course, people have already got a bachelor degree or another postgraduate degree, was growing due to the past increase in participation rates. And so what we actually see, except for a bit of a, a spike at the end, is the percentage of the eligible market who are actually enrolled has been going down, sort of contrary to all these arguments about increased need for education. Unfortunately, the department's enrolment data, as you all know, is extremely slow in coming out, uh, but we do have a bit of a lead indicator in fee help estimated lending, and you can see that after that COVID-related spike, uh, what we see is that fee help has gone down and been pretty flat the last couple of years. Uh, and for public universities, 96% of the fee help is, uh, is postgraduate lending. So again, we're just simply not seeing uh, the expected strength in the postgraduate, domestic postgraduate market. Now, as you all know, uh, the international market took a huge blow when the borders were shut for the best part of two years. Um, perhaps not as bad as I expected and probably many people in this room expected in the sense that international students uh, were willing to study uh, online, offshore, in numbers that we did not expect. Uh, but for a system addicted to significant year-on-year -year growth in international students, and having built-in expenditure, assuming that this growth would continue, uh, 2020 and 2021 were very traumatic. So that's also showing in revenue from international students, which also went down. But in perhaps the only good news slide I've got today, <laughs> uh, the numbers are recovering strongly. Uh, these are numbers to the month shown. Uh, you can see that numbers to March this year actually, commencing numbers are actually above where they were in 2019. So we probably still do have some pipeline effects with the people who should have started in earlier years not being here. But nevertheless, that's an extremely positive sign. And I think this will continue, at least in the short term, but there's a few issues that concern me about where this might be going. One is that the international education industry in Australia has been very much bound up with migration policy, particularly since the Howard era. International students get in the points-based visas, they get extra points not available to other people with similar qualifications. And so this has made Australia an attractive destination for international students hoping to migrate to Australia. And as you can see there, about 70% uh, say that the possibility of migration is a factor in choosing Australia. Not necessarily the most important factor, but a factor. And so the question is, what happens if policy changes? So, there was a big review of migration policy earlier this year, the Parkinson Review. One policy change is coming to effect this weekend, which is that there's going to be a cap uh, reinstated on international student hours. 
Uh, if you've been looking at the media the last week or so, stories about international students who swear they can't survive on the, the capped hours, that could have effects on retention and on future uh, flows, particularly from India and Nepal and countries like that where the students are very dependent on the Australian labour market. I won't go through all the issues uh, in the Parkinson Review, but one is a little bit concerned about some of the government's messaging on this and how it might be interpreted. So they do not like this issue of the so-called permanent temporaries. People strung along on temporary visa after temporary visa, delaying important life decisions in the hope of getting permanent residence. I don't like it either, I think it's really bad. So what they're saying is they want clear up pathways to permanent residence for international students, which I think is being interpreted as easier pathways. But that is not what it means. <laughs> what it means is that for people with qualifications in certain areas, there will be much easier, probably an easier for them way of getting to permanent residence. But for everyone else, you'll actually be clear that you'll never get it. And once that message sinks in, uh, that may affect people. You know, people to degrees like accounting, which have been, you know, huge numbers of people are applying for points-based visas based on their accounting qualification. Very unlikely to be on this favoured list. This, I guess, is another kind of semi-good news slide. So, there's been an extraordinary boom in research expenditure in Australia. If you look back, it's what, very low in the 60s and 70s and 80s, really takes off. It's about $12.7 billion in uh, 2020, the last time the ABS did a survey. Now, there are some questions about how good the ABS's numbers are, and so we wouldn't say these are precisely right, but I think there's a lot of other evidence that there has been something completely remarkable happening uh, given the previous history in research in Australia. So I've had a very substantial increase in the research workforce, 60% increase headcount this, uh, this century. Uh, a lot of this has been research students who have been indispensable to this huge expansion in research. And on the staff side, there's been an increase in numbers, but also I think an intensification of the work as teaching and research staff numbers have declined relative to the research-only staff numbers. So I've been able to put uh, many more hours into research than in, in previous years. We've also seen journal publications, quintuple, I don't think I've ever used that word before, uh, this century. These these include co-authored articles. I've seen reports that uh, over half of Australian articles have international co-authors, so this is not simply the efforts of Australian academics, they're using their foreign counterparts as well. But again, evidence of an extraordinary increase in research outputs and the ERA exercises, which have a you know, broader metrics than just journal articles, are also showing absolutely massive increases in research outputs. So the big question is, how has this all been paid for and can we continue paying for it? So I stress with this slide, I'm combining data with multiple different, so from multiple different sources, uh, none of which were designed to answer this question. But it is such an important question that I felt you know, compelled I had to do this, even if you can say that some of these numbers are a little bit off. Well, the first two numbers aren't off, the two, they're two accurate ones. So basically we've got about 37% of research expenditure explained by uh, Commonwealth grants. We've got another couple of billion that are in the higher education research data collection from other sources. All earmarked to research, about 54% of the total is explained by these sources. I'm sure there are other research sources that don't qualify for the HDRDC, uh, but nevertheless, we're left with an extremely large amount of expenditure which is unexplained. Now there's investment earnings and donations that aren't tied, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But if you look at my estimated teaching profits, which is basically uh, taking the estimates from the Deloitte Access Economics Teaching Costs Report and deducting it from the fee revenue in the department's finance accounts, you're getting a number that very neatly covers all of it and leaves a bit for something else. So essentially, I think the, the key reason that research is at the scale it is, is profits on teaching. Can we sustain this? The reason I wanted to show that slide on the reduced Commonwealth supported funding rates is that domestic students by policy design will in future contribute very little profit 
uh, to supporting research. Probably some in some institutions, but vastly less. I think when I did this with 2018 figures, they estimated about $1.3 billion in profit from that. It'll be much, much lower now. You've got postgrad domestic students. Some of the fees are pretty high. There's probably good profit margins in them, but the aggregate revenue is not going anywhere at this point. So effectively what this means is that we're going to be even more reliant on international students to fund this than we were before, and before we regard this as a serious problem. So it's an even worse problem now. The other issue is how have teaching profits been so high? And one of the reasons is that a lot of the teaching has done, been done by casual staff, most of whom are on the lowest level A rank and pay scale, which has meant that profits are pretty high. Now, as you're all aware, there's been large amounts of negative media around this issue over the last couple of years. Uh, industrially, it's a big issue, and I think uh, politicians in Canberra also think it is a big issue. Now, I don't think casuals will ever go away completely. They're, they're a necessary part of the system. But as we move, perhaps, to more of the teaching being done by teaching only, particularly staff, uh, the costs of teaching will go up and the profits will go down. And so again, even though this would be a very desirable change, uh, in my view, it will nevertheless reduce resources available for research activity. These funding constraints will probably flow through to uh, fewer staff, uh, possibly fewer uh, domestic research students. I think this is a combination of, I haven't got the numbers, but I suspect that for similar reasons to the other uh, domestic markets, this might be stressed by the ready availability of jobs at this point. Uh, so that might go down. And as people start paying more decent stipends, that will mean essentially that smaller number of students will get you know, higher pay rates, which is a good thing, but means that total output will probably go down. The one bright side here is just looking at the visa numbers. The number of international research students uh, is, in, as of March, was slightly up on what it was pre-COVID. So that's, that's one good sign. So in summary, I think we'll probably get some relief from the accord. I think the international student market is recovering well. Uh, the larger birth cohort will increase domestic demand. On the negatives, fiscal constraints limit policy change. Uh, domestic participation rates seem to be heading slightly down. We've got a broken employment model. Uh, research is ever more reliant on international students, and the international student market could be affected by uh, changes to migration policy. So thank you. Thank you, Andrew, for a compelling talk. It was a bit bleak, I must Sorry. say. <laughs> I'm a bad news guy. <laughs> yeah, quite bad. Um, so there are some questions that came through sliders. I'll take those first. Um, the first one is, how do you see demand and financial implications and trends for short courses delivering into the public universities? The short courses? Yeah. Yeah. OK, I'm a, I'm a skeptic on this one. <laughs> So there's been a bit of a misconception that you know, people doing training after they leave university is some, something new. It's not remotely new. Uh, it's been going on probably since, since we had you know, industrial enterprises that were capable of doing it. If anything, it's been trending down slightly over time. micro and universities have been earning about $140 million a year out of continuing education, pretty small in the scheme of things. Micro-credentials really add a, a credential and possibly you can count it towards a future degree. But I suspect that compared to the players in the market now, universities will have very high costs and therefore not be competitive outside very niche areas where simply the other players could never possibly get in. Mm. So I don't think this is going to be big. And you know, I've been very critical of extending fee help to micro-credentials. So this was a question from me. You spoke about clearer pathways for res residency for international yeah. students. Uh, you spoke about a need for education in the regional areas. But we know at the same time that there is a lack of 
certain resources and skills in the regional areas, for example, healthcare, a real challenge and a growing challenge in the future. Do you think we have a responsibility to our international students in that area and are we being irresponsible in sending them to regional universities? Sending them to regional universities. Well, like one of the reasons they go there is they get extra points for mm. being in the region. So, again, we just use migration policy all the time to deal with our own social policy issues. Look, the regional universities have a very strong lobby group, or mm. not just the regional universities network, but lobbyists generally. Look, uh, this is a kind of a semi market system, so mm. I think, you know, clearly there are issues in the regions, and if people want to go there, fine. They're also cheaper. Mm. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> You're an eco economist. <laughs> okay, so there's another question here. At the risk of mentioning the word business, when speaking about educational institutions, is there a path to unis being self-sustaining and less government reliant? No. Yeah. <laughs> Look, you could, you could, mm. but you'd be a very different institution. And frankly, I think, you know, this university and most universities are public universities. They have a much broader agenda than just being an independent research and teaching institutions. And therefore, I think, you know, they, even though I'm sceptical a lot of government policy, they're completely within their rights to say, you should be doing things that serve the Australian population. Mm. So this is one last question because we do want to hear from Alex in a little while, is if you had this magic ball and you could do anything you want to, what is the one thing that you would think we should invest in to make a real difference in the future? I guess I like structural things that last. Um, I guess my, my long-term interest has been in the, the demand-driven funding system which we used to have. Uh, mm. It would deal completely, I think, with that demographic surge that we are seeing without any particular need for bureaucrats and cameras saying, you know, 1,000 places here, 2,000 places there. And it would enable universities to move their student load between disciplines much mm. more easily than they can now, which would you know, enable them to meet you know, shifts in the labour market, which are notoriously hard to predict, but mm. do show up in mm. the student applications. Okay, thank you very much for your talk, Andrew. I'm sure there's going to be lots of conversation in the time in between. So please do use Andrew while he's here to pick his brain on these issues. Our next talk is by uh, Alex Steele. So Alex, Professor Alex Steele is going to talk to us on AI in education and he's going to give you some perspective from UNSW. Alex is the Pro Vice Chancellor Education and Student Experience at UNSW. He is a professor of law with research interests in both education and criminal law. Alex's education publications range across the pedagogy and regulation of legal education, curriculum design, assessment practice, which he does a lot of at UNSW, student well-being and staff development. His criminal law research focuses on property and dishonesty offences. Alex has received numerous teaching awards, including the Commonwealth Government Citation for Outstanding Contributions to Student Learning and the Vice Chancellor's Award for Teaching Excellence. So I'm going to hand over to Alex. You've seen his slides already. Thanks, Nalini. It's always dangerous to write a CV and then forget where you put it, isn't it? Um, um, look, um, I'm talking about the AI Armageddon or the AI Mageddon or however you want to put it. Um, the, the, I suppose the sort of first question to ask is, are we talking about some sort of fundamental change to life? Um, is it like the invention of the printing press where suddenly things can be multiplied um, around the world at speed or is it something like the rise of capitalism where the artisan who spent a year, spent sort of a career learning to make something with skill suddenly is replaced by um, hordes of people in factories who can produce shoddy goods but for a better profit. Is that what AI will do to, to knowledge? Um, or, you know, should we just keep calm and get on with it? I, I think that's where we're at at the moment. We really don't know which of these sort of outcomes, um, is it good, is it bad, is it something that will just go away? So. We're right in the middle of that, this at the moment, and, it, and it's messy. So the first question really, I think, is to say, well, what is it that our students want to know? Because we've got lots of ideas, but what do they really want to know? 
and they want to know if they're allowed to use it. And they, they don't want to cheat, they actually want to do the right thing, but they really, really are panicking about, am I allowed to use this or will I get into trouble? So what they're really looking for is certainty, but at times they're asking for more certainty than we can give them, and really what we're all trying to do is cope with uncertainty in, in times of change. The other thing they really want to know is, and these are AI-generated images, you can tell, um, we pick the ones that are AI and the ones that aren't. Um, how is AI going to be used in my career? And will, by the time I graduate, will everything have moved on so far that I'm, in fact I'm already out of date? And are you going to teach me? So we've got students in first year saying to academics, guys, tell me all about AI. And of course, they're faster at learning this stuff than we are. So there is a, there's a fundamental sort of speed of change issue that we're all grappling with. So, so my talk is supposed to be a sort of a recap of how we've been coping um, this year so far. Um, so what we've done is we've taken, like most universities, a principles approach. And we've basically said, we don't want to be scared of AI. We want to incorporate it into everything that we do. Um, but we have to be a little bit cautious. So in terms of what we've been saying to our students, we've been saying, if you use AI, make sure you attribute it. If you attribute it, then you're not hiding your use. And if it's a mistake, we'll be able to cope with it. And we've been saying to them, it's all about trying to work out what is it that you were actually asked to do in the assessment? Read the assessment instructions, and we've been saying to staff, be really clear about what you're asking your students to do. Because once we get that communication between staff and students about the assessment and about the use of AI, a lot of these issues just really disappear. So it's really a communication gap in lots of ways that, that we're dealing with. Um, so to help with that, we've done what everybody, I think, has done. We've produced websites that have explained um, how to use AI in assessment. We've had question and answer sessions, we run workshops with students, and this is really good for those students who can find it, but for lots of students, um, you know, they don't pay attention to things that adults tell them because adults don't know. So, so um, in those circumstances, it really then comes back to the convener of a course to make sure that what's in the course outlines is actually linking back to these things. So just in time is very important for students. So similarly for staff who came back from what they thought was a relaxing Christmas break to discover that the world had changed on them, um, we also said, yes, there, there are these principles on AI that will help. And the staff said, well, that's great, but how do I actually do it in my assessment? So we produced a series of typologies for staff. Here are some words that you can put into your course outlines to explain the levels of AI that are appropriate in, in your assessment. And we particularly made sure that we were not creating a university level definition of what was acceptable because the key thing is what's the learning outcome for the assessment? What's this course all about? Because it's only when you know that that you know what the level of AI use um, for that course, um, what's appropriate for that assessment. So we really focused on making it convener level controlled use of AI, which again created all sorts of stress I think for staff because staff themselves are dealing with the uncertainty of I don't know if this will work, what will it do to my assessment? So we've been through a, a, a real process of that in, in term one. Um, and then um, Turnitin released um, an AI checker tool and some universities said, this is too unknown, we're not gonna go near it. We decided we could trust our staff to actually use it appropriately and to, to learn what, what it would be good for and what it would be um, not so good for. So we produced, we released it, we produced some advice on what it was, we gave a lot of um, advice about what it didn't do and mistakes and false positives it could create. And we also um, put a lot of work into sort of explaining to staff that didn't prove anything on its own. It was just the start of a conversation. Um, and then back that up with lots of resources. And I think everybody's done this. We've got SharePoint sites, we've got websites, we've got team channels, we've got um, communities of practice. And these are, this is just some of them. And, all the faculties are reproducing that as well. So it, it, it seems, I think, at one level a little bit chaotic, but at another level, this is the sort of the research phase that we're all going through. So we're all experiencing it differently, differently in, in different disciplines. And the process will, through, through these channels, I think, as we come towards the end of the year, we'll start to have a really rich understanding of how AI can be used in education. Because the worst thing we could have done would have been to go out at the beginning not really know what we were talking about and saying, here are the rules. So it's a, you know, we have to hold back on making those decisions and let people work things out. Um, so how have we amended assessments? Um, again, another AI-generated image. Um, 
So um, this is sort of a, a little bit of a snapshot of the sorts of things people have done that, um, in, in this last term. And these are assessments that aren't sort of AI based, but they are how do you actually deal in a world of assessment to make sure that the, what you're getting from the student um, actually um, has been generated by the student. So essays, um, as, as we suggested at the beginning of the year to people, um, if you come up with quite specific topics or you require particular types of, of critique or you're using class uh, materials or things that are really, really current, the AI models generate, the large language models just generate sort of fairly average and incoherent answers. Um, oral assessment is making a resurgence. Um, we've always had class participation. Um, different disciplines have used um, vivas and, and discussion-based things, but I think that that is coming back in. And I think there's a huge potential here. If we can do it efficiently, what we're really starting to do is to create a, a dialogic form of assessment so that the student can then demonstrate to the teacher um, and, and what they've done and, and develop some sort of pride in what they're producing. So vivas and, and oral interaction can actually be a really positive thing that AI is going to push us back towards. Um, and then really interesting sort of specific methods. So um, in coding, in maths, in those sorts of areas, people are actually asking students to use particular techniques to solve a problem. So it's not necessarily the most efficient technique or the common technique, but it's a way that demonstrates the student's understanding of that technique. And the AI models generally won't do that because they will want to revert back to what the most common predictable way of solving something is. Um, mixing text and, and drawing in open book assessments. Um, and I loved the, the one that um, one course told us that they tested every multiple choice question against AI and if the AI got it wrong, it went into the test. <laughs> the feedback was the test got a bit harder, but... Um, <laughs> um, and then in long, longer projects, that real sense of a longitudinal approach to assessment so that you, you build through stages and you use the feedback of each stage to work on to the next stage. I think that's, that's a really positive thing that sort of um, assessment redesign will push us towards. And um, these really interesting ones of working in groups and then writing individual pro reports about the group work, um, which is by definition going to be very individualistic and hard for AI to do, much more than help with the language around. Um, and then posters and videos also really good, although I suspect in a year's time there'll be great AI um, uh, platforms that'll produce amazing videos and posters for us, so they may have a limited shelf life. More positively, though, I think we are really starting to look at how do we actually get the students to use AI, expect the use of AI. Now, at this stage, we've got to be careful about licensing issues and privacy issues, but I think by the end of the year, we are probably going to be in a position where we'll be mainstreaming AI as part of assessment um, in the sense that you can either require the student to write with AI and critique it, or you can ask the student um, to draw on drafts or possibly to use a draft and put it into an appendix. So all of these sorts of things are, are going to be um, relevant. But going back to the sort of the policing thing, and again, see the AI hand there, um, the, the, the question of, so this is the thing about detection, isn't it? You just have to look carefully and then you can immediately see there's an issue. Um, the, the AI tool's been really interesting, I think, for us because what it's really done is it's been a helpful way for students to do the right thing. So students actually don't want to um, sort of take shortcuts with AI, but they're tempted to do that unless there's a countervailing force. So the idea that there is in fact some mechanism for checking I think has been really helpful for students and it's helped students who worried about other students cheating. So that's, that's been a positive. It's also I think been really positive for staff in that once you put your assessment through um, in this term and you've seen what the AI reports have looked like, if there's very few of them, then you can be certain that your assessment is actually fairly AI resistant. If it's a, got a lot of AI um, reporting going on, then the real question is whether you want to embrace that and whether you actually want the assessment to be based around AI. Um, we haven't seen huge spikes in AI reported misconduct centrally. Um, and, and that's, an inter that's interesting in itself because the ones that tend to have popped up have been contract cheating situations where um, these poor students felt so much pressure that they paid someone to write their answer and they thought the person was writing their answer and they hand over the money for it and in fact that what they got back was something from chat GPT. So they got sort of stung twice. Um, and we suspect lots of AI company, uh, contract cheating companies have been doing this for a while so this is going to flush that out as well. 
Um, but the other thing that sort of it, it's exposed is that there's been a lot of use of grammar correction software and students who've been using um, writing in one language and translating into another. And that's something that we've sort of anecdotally known has happened, but the existence of this tool now allows us to see the, the extent of it and that it allows us to have conversations with ourselves about whether or not we think that's acceptable and with students about whether it's the right way to do things. Um, workload issues though, because at the moment there really isn't a dashboard view and that's a problem, but I think by the end of the year when Turnitin release a dashboard view, that's going to help. And I'm really looking forward to institutional views of, of the, the prevalence of AI detection across courses because that, I think, will then help us to understand um, exactly what our, sort of our, our issues are around assessment. Um, and in terms of investigating AI reports, as I said um, before, we've made a really, really strong emphasis that this is not a detection tool. It doesn't prove anything. It, it's a flag. It's a way to start a conversation. And it's been really, really important for us to say to staff and to students that it's the start of a conversation. So just because something is flagged doesn't mean that you actually have been cheating. All it means is that there's a reason to have a conversation about why is it that, that it's coming up in that way. And in lots of ways, I think if we can really sort of move beyond that sort of knee-jerk reaction to a, a much more um, normalisation of this, as I said, it's almost like vivas. It's, you, you mightn't get it in every course, but in lots of courses you'll have your lecturer just say to you, hey, can you tell me about your essay? What did you think? What, what was your favourite part about it? Which, which bit are you most proud of? Then I think we can actually start to build some really positive sort of communication um, channels. And they have to be timely. You don't want to be asked four weeks later, why did you write paragraph six? Because as the student said, we forgot the next day anyway. We had the next assignment to do. Um, and, and I think all of this is, all, all of these tools are also really sort of encouraging us to rethink our assignments. So we've, as academics, we have a feedback mechanism to know how effective our, our assessments are. Um, so what are the students telling us themselves about how they're using it? So really interesting things. Students are using AI tools to write emails to us so that the emails are more professional and so we understand what they're actually asking. Um, we, we've got a huge use immediate uh, already by students using it for pre professional purposes because as you know in, if you've just come out of high school it's hard to understand how to write it in the professional way so resumes cvs um, complaints to lecturers are all now being chat gpt generated um, so that's really good uh, students are using it a lot with helping with their studies so there's that inspiration thing of i don't know what what topic to pick give me some topics i don't know how to structure this answer give me some structure um, I wonder what a, an answer might look like on this topic. Give me a first draft. And, and one of the things we know for, from learning is that if a student has never seen an answer for a topic before, they're in the dark on their first attempt. So there's a whole lot of really positive things where students are actually using AI. They're not writing their answer with it, but it's really informing the way they then approach their answer. Um, and it's also helping them with their learning too. So you say something in the lecture that made no sense to anybody except you, they can just ask ChatGPT to explain it in simple terms. So that, that's been really helpful for students. Um, it helps them to summarise notes, although they themselves recognise that the shortcutting of that process can be, um, those shortcuts can be detrimental to them. So they also are, are telling us that they're struggling with how do they make themselves do the hard work in order to get the learning rewards. So it's a really sort of intelligent conversation I think the students are having with us and with themselves. And really interesting ones about recording lectures, um, which I have some sort of copyright and privacy issues around, but I think we have to recognise this is going to be happening. So if you're giving a class, there's probably somebody with a laptop with an AI program summarising what you're saying. There's probably somebody in the room doing it now. Um, and, and research skills. Huge advances on research skills. I, um, you know, I had to go to the library and learn the Dewey Decimal System to find a book and then I had to photocopy it. Um, if I could, you know, queue up for the photocopier, then the next generation discovered Google, Google Scholar with a list of links. Now you get the link and you get the summary, so you don't need to click through to the link, so you can find out. So I think there's a huge set of advances there, which then give the students more time to spend on writing the answer, so we can redesign assessments in light of that. Um, but others, as I said back at the beginning, really worry about what, which ones of these am I allowed to do, which are ethical, which, which are going to get me into trouble. So there's this massive 
um, desire from students for us to help to explain. And the answer to that really in lots of ways is that for, for, for every course, when you start the course, have a conversation with your students about your expectations and understand their use and start the conversation and then these issues go away. So um, in terms of teaching, um, there's a whole lot of interesting things coming out at the moment. We've got people who are using um, AI to generate rubrics, to generate learning outcomes, learning outlines, learning outcomes. If you've got to do some regulatory thing for the university, why not do it on AI? You know, there's a, there's a whole lot of mechanical, if you like, I was going to say manual, but they're, not, they're, they're important, but they're mechanical um, processes that we can, we can save, um, get our time back by using with AI. And I think that there's no detriment to the student in doing that. So it's a lot of um, really helpful things there. Um, sorry, I was just talking to a, um, a blank screen. That's what I was saying. Um, and, and the other thing that's, that's really significant too is the ability to instantly create case studies and exemplars in class. So you can show a student, uh, you can create a, a case study for a scenario um, with just a few key points and then you've got something rich for the students to talk about in class. Or um, if you really want to show the students what an average answer is to the problem you've just set, get ChatGPT to produce an answer in class and then you can all pick it apart and at the end of it all the students themselves realise that they're smarter than the AI. So there's a huge amount of um, capacity to have a sort of a, a not very good student in your class who's the AI who you can ethically pick on. So that's, that's a the really helpful thing. Um, and, um, and, and I think we haven't really got to this yet, but the whole notion of personal tutors, um, I know the students are already doing it, but how do we actually incorporate it into our own classroom and how do we start to think about out of class um, tutoring which is based and trained on the materials that we've got for the courses. I mean, we've got licensing to sort through, but I think by next year we'll be having a whole lot of ancillary teaching being done with AI and that's really going to help us to, to really move ahead in terms of discussion-based learning. In terms of curriculum, um, I think we're, we're looking at the issue of um, scaffolding AI through the degree. I mean, we have to assume that by next year there are students coming out of um, high schools who are more proficient at AI than we are in lots of ways, but what they don't know is the discipline area. So what we've got to do is we've got to assume that they will be using AI to answer every question um, that we set them or every, every activity they're doing. So we need to think about how do we actually scaffold their use so that they use it appropriately and they know when, when is the answer right and when is the answer wrong. Um, which means I think we need to rethink the starting point of knowledge um, and skills. So we, what, what don't we have to teach them anymore? What can we just assume that the AI will predictably get right each time so we don't need to worry about that? And, are they ever going to be in a world where there isn't an AI on their phone? So how much of it do they really need to know? And these are really difficult conversations for us to have given we've got an entire lifetime dedicated. I mean, my research area is in the crime of larceny, which is a you know, middle-aged offence that every, every jurisdiction in the world except for New South Wales has abolished. And I'm waiting for New South Wales to do it and then I won't have a research career. You know, it's, that's the sort of thing, I think, that, that we are all grappling with, with AI. So what we've really got to focus on are the creative and critical aspects of knowledge. It's asking the questions rather than producing the, the, the data that is really um, what higher education is about. And as somebody pointed out to me this week, what we've really got to think about is what are the methodologies that each discipline uses to critique AI? So um, different disciplines probably will have different ways of, of um, unpacking an AI-produced um, output to work out whether it's true, and that may be different across different disciplines. So the thing that might differentiate the disciplines is their approach to a critical analysis of AI. Um, so yeah, let AI do all the predictable stuff, and then we get to play with the unpredictable stuff. Um, so that then probably means, as sort of a concluding thought, that um, is AI quality um, the, the competence level? So if you've done your first draft and you put it back into AI and AI says fix this and you say yes and you, you keep interacting with the AI to get your answer to perfect in terms of the AI, is that what we expect as a submission standard for assessment lead into the future? So that we won't actually care about how polished your final product is, we will expect it to be perfectly polished. What we'll actually be looking at is the underlying ideas and the concepts that you used when you constructed it, because everybody's answer will be perfect. 
but their underlying idea might be flawed. And I think that completely turns around our notion of what we're trying to do in assessment in universities. So institutionally, um, we need to um, get very nimble and agile. We can't have three-year processes for changing degrees and structures and that kind of stuff. We're going to have to change things constantly, so I think we have to move to a principles-based approach to the way in which we think about quality. Um, and um, I think we are going to need huge investment in professional development for staff so that we all understand what's happening in AI, because frankly we don't. And we're going to be out, out, we're already probably behind lots of other people in terms of understanding it. We also need to bring industry into the classroom because industry is the cutting edge of, of the use of AI. And they need to be there to help us to develop that curriculum. But at the same time, we have a really important role, fundamentally important role, to tell industry where the biases are, where the flaws are, where the issues are to the shiny things that we actually can stand back and tell, tell people how to use AI in appropriate ways. And so I think that's good luck. Thank you. <laughs>
I think it's incredibly hard, isn't it? I mean, unless you're, unless you're completely... So, you know, I, my kids got annoyed with me over January because I was obsessed by AI. And then I came back to... Um, you know, I kept sort of doing answers in chat GPT, you know, sort of thing. Um, and, and then when I came back to uni, everybody else had had a holiday. And so I realised, I was going, this is a big thing, we've got to do stuff. And I was going, what? What is this? Um, and then a month later, um, everybody was going, oh my God, this is it. And I went, oh yeah, I've done that. Um, um, it, so I think timing is everything. So I think our accrediting bodies are catching up. They're not quite where we are but they are very quickly going to get far ahead of us because they are much more connected to, to industry than us. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's going to be a really useful and fruitful conversation to have with the, the, the accrediting bodies. But I think the, the, really, um, the really big issue that we have to have in these times of change is humility. So we have to be humble about what we know and they have to be humble about what they know. And if we could actually all be fairly humble about it, then I think we'd come to a solution. Mm. I think I really like the principled approach that we have, but we also do have things like Turnitin and Turnitin Checker. Knowing that there is a false positive rate, do you think it's acceptable for risk for us to use that as a case for investigating AI, especially since it's likely that we're going to be wrong as often as we are right? That's really interesting. So there's, there's um studies that are coming out into um, the use of these tools and there are lots of small scale studies and we, so we, we're really waiting for really large scale studies. Mm -hmm. But a um, couple of studies that I, that I saw recently um, suggested that um, the ability for a human to pick AI is about 50% and the ability for these checkers to pick AI is probably about 80%. Mm -hmm. That's still not 100%. Yeah. And plus there's false positives. But the, the, um, the larger ones at least seems to be built with a bias against picking AI. So they, so what I, I suppose what I'm trying to say is it's a, I think, we'd be, I think we'd be crazy to not use these tools as a way of alerting us to issues, but I think we'd equally be crazy if we actually thought, if we rested on that, because it is a black box. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, academic integrity and plagiarism is an academic judgment, it's not a technical judgment. And we all know from use of similarity checkers over the years that just because you get a similarity score of 60 doesn't mean there's anything wrong with the paper. But if you get a similarity score of 5%, it may be terrible. So it, it's really about saying, OK, this is just have a second look and then use your judgment. The real tricky thing at the moment is we don't have enough experience with looking at papers to feel confident that we can exercise our judgment. And that's something we just have to work through. Mm. It's a good place for us to be, right? We're co-learning with our students, mm. which is really quite exciting. So there is opportunities with AI, and if I ask you to look into the future, what do you hope AI will deliver for education? Oh, well, I mean, I've watched lots of science fiction books, and I've, uh, <laughs> lots of science fiction films and read lots of books. So I'm, I'm, really, um, I'm really sort of hopeful that somehow, um, all of the menial tasks that we don't want to do will be taken away from us, and all of the fun ones that we want to do will be enhanced. Um, but I, my, my suspicion is that all of these dreams sort of never really come to pass, and we'll still be doing the same jobs we were doing you know, 20 years ago in 20 years' time, um, but there'll be tweaks to it because of the AI. But yeah, I, I think you know, AI is a bit like washing machines, isn't it? I mean, it's, it really has... Washing machines had huge social benefits. Mm but the washing still has to be done every week. Unfortunately. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. Thank it was you. a wonderful talk and a wonderful conversation. Um, I do want to thank Andrew and Alex both together. Can you just give them a round of applause? What a fantastic start we've had to the first hour of this three hours. We're going to have about 50 minutes now to socialize, chat, talk about the things that we've heard, and we have provided you with some really great refreshments. There's some really cute cupcakes. They are edible. Please take one. Uh, yeah, and we'll gather again at 5 o'clock. Thank you.
Everyone, so good to see everyone socialising in the room. Just giving you the heads up, we've got about five more minutes. Five more minutes, if you can make your way to your table, that would be fabulous. Thank you. Okay, everybody, please take your seats. Okay, we're in the process of shutting our doors, coming back together. Okay. So everybody, so great to see you all in the room. My name's Patsy Polly, and together with Nalini Patha, we are the directors of the Science Education Academy, but you know that already. I'd just like to draw attention to the other Science Education Fellows who are in the room. Please wave your hands or stand up, say hi to everybody. We represent our faculties and we come together and we have lots of discussion about these issues in higher education. So how wonderful for us to have the opportunity to hold space for us all, to think, to come together, share ideas and socialise, because it's been a while, right? So this occasion is quite important in that it's the first time it's been done at our university and we come together and we also welcome so many other universities who are joining us today, around 30 
and then organisations, around 20 other organisations outside of the university um, sphere. So thank you very much for joining us today. So the word Scientia, you've probably heard that a lot at this event. And for colleagues joining us from outside of UNSW, it means knowledge. And it's a part of our motto, Scientia Corda Mente et Manu, knowledge by heart, mind and hand. And I didn't even do Latin at school. Okay, so the Science Education Academy comprises of about 50 fellows who are recognised um, leaders in education. Okay, so this is an opportunity for us to come together as a community, share ideas and cultivate thought leadership and inspire our educational excellence at UNSW and beyond. So, today's activities were supported by the former acting DVCESE, Louise, Professor Louise Lutzemann, and PVCESE, Professor Alex Steele, uh, who are both SEFs, and especially our Deputy uh, Vice-Chancellor, Academic Quality, Merlin Crossley. And the idea is to initiate these high-level discussions and come together, okay? We can do this in 2D, but how much better is it when we're in the room together? So, it's my pleasure really to invite um, Professor Merlin Crosley, our Deputy Vice-Chancellor Academic Quality, who will introduce our panel members. But before I do that, I would like to really overview Merlin's profile for you. Merlin is an amazing person, we all know that, but he is a Deputy Vice-Chancellor Academic Quality at UNSW and Professor of Molecular Biology. Um, he has also worked uh, and studied overseas at universities in Oxford, Harvard, he's worked at, um, studied at Melbourne, he's been recognised by numerous awards, including a Rhodes Scholarship, uh, the Australian Academy of Sciences Gottschalk Medal, for example. He has significant contributions to, made contributions to academic administration, serving as Dean at UNSW since 2010 and pre previously having uh, been Acting Deputy Vice-Chancellor Research at the University of Sydney from 2006 to 2008. He's an enthusiastic science communicator. You've probably seen Merlin tweeting and on LinkedIn, right, so do something everybody, tweet, so he can retweet it. Okay, so he is the um, Chair of the Editorial Board of the Conversation of UNSW Press, Deputy Director of the Australian Science Media Centre, Member for the ed Editorial Board of Bioessays, my goodness, so many things, Merlin. Okay, and recently I'd like to also um, congratulate uh, Merlin for being appointed as a member of the Order of Australia for his significant service to education and molecular biology. So let's just stop there for a minute. With all of this background, we also have a person who impressively taught in T1, term one this year, a thousand students, a thousand first year students in Babs 1201 named mole Molecules, Cells and Genes. So congratulations, Merlin, for making it through the term. Well done. And now please come to the stage and um, introduce our speakers for the next session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patsy, for that excruciatingly embarrassing introduction. So I now am uh, going to call up our people for the panel one by one, and we're gonna have about 45 minutes to an hour, and I will introduce them. They're all coming up there now. Uh, so I have actually got ChatGPT to write their bios for them. Our first person uh, is Professor Sarah Madison, who is new NSW's new Deputy Vice-Chancellor Education and Student Experience. Sarah uh, was previously Deputy Vice-Chancellor Education Experience and Employability at Swinburne University, where she was a professor of astrophysics. You probably heard Swinburne sort of just the world's leading university in gravitational waves and astrophysics. So it's excellent to have you here, Sarah. <laughs> On our panel, we also have Theo Farrell. Theo Farrell is uh, currently Deputy Vice-Chancellor Academic Student Life at the University of Wollongong. Theo Farrell uh, 
is a historian, and he wrote an amazing book called um, The Unwinnable War uh, about uh, the impossibility of a vice chancellor winning or the community winning a war against the vice chancellor or the opposite of that, I'm not sure which, or it may have been about the war in Afghanistan. But when people found out that Theo was coming to this conference, he was uh, appointed uh, on the basis of that primarily as the new vice chancellor of La Trobe University. So congratulations, Theo. <laughs> we also have Professor Sally Kift, so Sally will be known to you as a Principal Fellow of the Higher Education Academy, a Fellow of the Australian Academy of Law, President of the Australian Learning and Teaching Fellows. She's been a Deputy Vice-Chancellor Academic at James Cook University. She's also been a Law Professor at Queensland University of Technology. And she is also a contributor to the esteemed encyclopedia of educational knowledge, like myself, Campus Morning Mail. Thank you, oh. Sally. <laughs> and finally, one of uh, my former colleagues, Professor Mark Hoffman. So Professor Mark Hoffman was, when I joined UNSW in 2010, he was Associate Dean Research in the Faculty of Science head of uh, the School of Material Science and Engineering, which was one of the most, or was the most research intensive school in the university at that stage, um, may still be. And uh, he went on to be Dean of the Faculty of Engineering. We're enormously proud of the excellence and the culture of the Faculty of Engineering, which uh, graduates, I think it's a third of engineers in Australia. Is it something like that, Mark? And Mark always wanted it to be half, but that'll be left to, to the future. Um, Mark did, did a great job uh, guiding that faculty. It's then moved up to Newcastle, where he's Deputy Vice-Chancellor Academic. And uh, he came down, uh, he drove down, I've been tracking Mark, in an autonomous vehicle just to get here. And he got here one minute ago. So congratulations, Mark. Thank you for joining us. So, I could leave you to it or I could guide the questions. I'll sit down and guide. So, I'm just looking at my clock, which is about to start. It hasn't started, so I will start instead. So, the slide behind me, I think, says 2030, the future is now. We all know that's not true, but what if the future were now? What, what is it going to be like in 2030? What is it going to be like further in the future? What challenges do we have? And what can we do to make a difference in the future of higher education? And I'd like to turn to my new colleague, Sarah. What do you think we might do to make a difference to make sure a university like this stays in touch as things keep changing? Over to you. Thanks very much, Merlin. Um, Merlin did let us know that we could be politicians and answer any question we liked, so um, I might shift it a little bit because it wasn't quite what I was thinking of. Um, in, in terms of thinking of sort of future is now, you know, what are the things that are here right now that are disrupting us, that are changing the way that we work, and we know will continue into the future? So I don't have the crystal ball to kind of go, well, what will the future look like? But I suppose, and, and what you had asked us is, what are the things that are kind of keeping us up at night? thinking about what those disruptions are. So a couple of you know, pithy comments from me, um, I suppose was around, as we um, heard Alex talk about, was AI and, and new technologies, um, which are clearly you know, very disruptive. And the things that I think keep me up at night is those technologies that we also seem to have been fighting. And I think on the sort of AI side, it's like there's no AI in AI, which is the academic integrity in artificial intelligence. And it's been, I think it's pretty interesting because we've got this moment now where people are either super excited by what AI can offer into higher education, and then we've got others that are terrified. Um, and I actually really loved Alex's final comment that we would not have coped at all with the AI influx in 2019. It just would have been way too much for us, but it's kind of like the resilience, sorry for using the word, I know it all gives us PSD, whatever, um, but the resilience that we've had from one dreadful experience or one major disruption makes us sort of a bit more able to think about the next. Um, but then how do we really make a difference of that? And I think 
again, you know, Alex has really covered a lot of those points. What I'd noted down is that we really need to embrace it, right? Like, this, you can't do your hide your head in the sand sort of thing. Um, and it's a learning moment, I suppose, for all of us in higher ed. It's a learning moment for the teachers at the coalface. It's absolutely a learning moment for the students. It's a learning moment as institutions, and then also as institutions within the national context. What does it mean, a higher education degree, all of those sorts of things. So it's a bit of a reckoning, if you like. Um, and my take on that is that, as Alex also said, um, you know, we, the students are gonna learn way faster than most staff, most staff will. Um, so let's learn together with them. So that's the sorts of things, and that's gonna keep changing. Technology will continue to move at a much faster pace than we would like it to, I think, or that most of us would like to. So how are we going to incorporate that into what we do here within education? And the second point, which we've also seen from the recent disruptions, is our ways of working. And I don't know if there is actually a camera, I don't know where those online people are, but hi, online people. Um, you know, the work from home, the hybrid working, the high flex, et cetera, has impacted all of us super dramatically. For academics, maybe a tiny bit, I mean, I don't wanna say it's not been dramatic. Academics have had freedom previously about how often they came in and out of work. That's all I wanted to say there. For professional staff, the change of COVID has been super dramatic because they were pretty much never allowed to work from home. But in terms of an educational context, how this is really impacting our sort of, I suppose, our fundamental questions about what is engagement because we engage with the students in the classroom. We expect the students to engage with each other as a learning community. So I think this has really challenged what our thoughts are about what is a learning community? What is engagement? What is meaningful engagement? How do we make the most of what happens online, hybrid, high flex? We can now be much more global. Um, all of us have this expression of being global universities. Well, COVID has sort of shown us that we can do that. So in terms of making a difference now, I think it's about really experimenting with it, different ways of learning, different ways of being a community across different areas, so within different cohorts, within different communities of people and within different disciplines, because what will work for one group won't necessarily work for another. And as we move into the future, that'll clearly change again. I don't know how, but it will change. So how do we maintain community, maintain engagement in this really changing landscape? So they were my two pithy comments. Thanks, Mila. That's terrific. Thank you very much, Sarah. So yes, I mean, I think, People are uh, all thinking about how the world's changed with online after COVID and now AI. So if I could put the next question to following a similar theme to Theo, uh, you know, will, it, will it AI really transform universities and society? You know, human DNA hasn't changed. Uh, the human life cycle hasn't changed. A lot of things seem to be changing, but a lot of things, I mean, Andrew Norton showed our scale of what we're doing is changing. But so Theo, what do you think? Do you think that AI will really change university and society? Well, thanks, uh, and uh, thanks very much for inviting me to join this panel and this uh, great uh, discussion this afternoon, really fascinating talks earlier from Andrew and Alex. Um, and also, I really liked Alex's point around the fact is we don't fully know, of course. It, there's a lot of uncertainty, and we have to get pretty comfortable about uncertainty. But broadly speaking, I think the change is going to be profound and deep and fast. Um, and so broadly speaking, uh, the areas that I study, I'm, I'm an expert in military transformation. What you've seen is a revolution, revolutionary change that's occurred since the 1940s, and it's been powered by the electronics revolution that comes out of World War II and the Cold War. Um, and so change has gone faster and faster ever since. Um, I think AI is going to be comparable to the Industrial Revolution, but whereas the Industrial Revolution took eight decades to unfold, this will happen in a matter of years. And you just have to look at like, what's happening around. A chat GPT comes out, two months later has 100 million users. It's the fastest adoption of, of a consumer application in history. Uh, we don't actually know how far and wide BARD has reached, but BARD is the, as you folks will know, is the Gen AI application attached to Google search. Google search has eight to nine billion uses every single day. So one estimate that's been widely banded about, but we don't know, is that it'll reach a billion people. Um, and as more and more people experiment with this and they realize all the convenience that AI offers, it's, it's just gonna naturally change things. Um, and that's what's before us right now. 
Uh, and, well, what are the implications? There's, there's a really fantastic opportunity here for countries in the OECD. So m most countries in the OECD have a common problem, and that problem is productivity is flatlined. And it's flatlined for a very simple reason, that we've all moved towards service-based economies. So basically about 80% of our economy is a service-based economy. It's just really hard to get productivity in a service-based economy. AI and automation will return productivity to our economy. So that is the opportunity we have before us. Uh, but in so doing, it's going to displace a lot of job activities and jobs. We don't know how many, but somewhere between 25 and 45 percent of job roles and activities will be displaced in the coming decade. That's about three to six million jobs in Australia. That's the scale of turnover. So great opportunity to get productivity back in our economy, but a profound challenge to reskill the entire Australian workforce, well, practically. And if we don't do it, and we don't do it right, there's going to, we're going to, we risk increasing inequalities in our society. So really profound challenges that we as universities have a responsibility to be involved with. I think, and I, 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 you know, this is, I had a great discussion with Andrew, I think there's certainly a good discussion to be had around lifelong learning and the role of universities. And right now, of course, for universities, that's a challenge because we don't see revenue streams there. But I think we have a responsibility to step into that space. Um, what's it mean for us as, at universities? I think one of the challenges we face, the lesson I drew from COVID and online, I mean, broadly speaking, immense pride in my sector and, and colleagues, professional staff and academic staff, and students who all rolled up their sleeves and just got stuck in and just undertook rapid change in a matter of weeks. But also, just reflecting on that, all we did was catch up. Sectors all around us had already digitally transformed, and we hadn't. And unfortunately, the lesson I draw from that is that the academic sector is actually pretty bad at transformation. And, it, and it, that's got to do with the strength of our sector, which is the stability of our staff base, which gives us those deep strengths in academia, those deep knowledge foundations, and those wells in our academic disciplines. So we have to have stable academic workforces to achieve that. But it also means that we're actually very bad at transformation. So unfortunately, I think we're going to struggle to transform as we need to transform to better provide for our students because we all have a common mission to prepare and empower our students for their future. Um, but we have no choice. And I, I think with good leadership, the kind of leadership we see around us, people like Alex and so forth, we can get there, but I don't think it's going to be easy. But if we don't rise to the challenge, then we will not prepare Australia's workforce for the future, and we will not engage in this common struggle to reduce inequalities in our society. Yeah, I, I think you are right about academia relies on deep expertise and it is difficult for a professor of steam trains or something to move into the modern world. It is academics perfect their um, own knowledge of their discipline. So I think that I think that's a good point. I mean I would say the only thing you know as Alex said I was actually very impressed by how well we did move online during COVID, you know, um, myself included, actually, you know, I, because I wasn't someone who was pushing, we've got people who push the envelope with um, online teaching and innovation, and I wasn't one of those, but I got by with a little help from my friends, and I, I think it was pretty, it was pretty impressive. I do, I do agree that there will be impacts that may, um, yeah, even overshadow the impact of the washing machine, another one that Alex mentioned. Yeah, so I, I think that's good. So now if I turn to you, Sally, we, Theo mentioned lifelong learning, and I think what Theo said was, I think, quite good. I think there is a responsibility for universities to promulgate and um, disseminate knowledge, and I think that's a good thing, and helping people to do career transitions, upskills, etc., spreading knowledge is our but I think Theo also mentioned the revenue streams are a challenge. I think they're such a challenge uh, that I'm not sure how to do it. But Sally, you've got thoughts on lifelong learning. Have you got any answers to how best to make this contribution to society? Oh, well, I'm glad I got the easy question about <laughs> lifelong learning and not the other, the other two hard ones. Um, so I was on the AQF review panel. And of course, that's everyone's favourite subject, the AQF, the Australian Qualifications Framework. But a lot of the work that we did there under the leadership of the late, great Peter Noonan was directed to assuring 
um, an educational ecosystem, because we don't have an educational ecosystem at the moment, we've got three, and we've got three sectors that are siloed, K to 12, tertiary, um, and tertiary split into vocational and higher education. So we were trying to think, how could we progress what needs to be lifelong learning as a, as a practical reality for all citizens in, a, in an equitable way. So my first suggestion would be that we implement the AQF review reform in full, which has a lot of beautiful functioning parts to it, and if anyone wants to engage with the 150-odd page report. But part of that also was around all these moving parts that we need to bring together to make lifelong learning a practical reality for all citizens. You see, it just rolls off the tongue. Um, it's about better credit recognition, recognition of prior learning, recognition of prior experience, which we don't do very well at the moment between sectors. It's about smoothing pathways from second to tertiary, imagining that tertiary is some sort of connected, integrated system. We need quality careers advising over the lifespan we can't expect all citizens in all regions and, and areas and whatever their backgrounds or experiences to engage in whatever lifelong learning is if they don't understand what the career development learning opportunities are for them. If we, if we did proper career development learning from cradle to grave as a, a previous from a high chair to high, high chair to higher education, I think that was what Simon Birmingham used to say. Um, that, that requires leadership, and we do have a National Careers, um, sorry, National Careers Institute. If we started with the equity groups around good quality careers advising in school, where there is systemic disadvantage at the moment, I was shocked to read a piece in the conversation a couple of weeks, a few weeks ago. Only 80% of young people finished year 12 in 2022. So there's 20% of the population at the moment hasn't even got that basic foundational um, piece that they need to go on and engage in lifelong learning. We need a national lifelong learning strategy, I would say, to try and bring all these disparate pieces together. I'm going to say lifelong learning a lot. We need a national lifelong learning entitlement or a loan, such as they've just introduced in the UK. I'm not quite sure how that's going to go. But the idea, again, is that you spread the possibility and the funding and we need a sensible funding system, which we don't again have at the moment, um, across, across the lifespan. We need a lifelong learning um, record that people can aggregate their knowledge in, formal, informal, non-formal learning. We need a unified credentials platform. We have microcreds, whatever that is, seeker at the moment, and I'm sure whatever universities have their few microcreds on that are very pleased with themselves about that and congratulate themselves for that. Um, but it's only universities, it's not private providers. There's no national credit point system, so there's no currency that people can trade in the, in the micro-credential system. Um, it doesn't have vocational education. It's like, you know, we want to have a connected tertiary system, but let's do a micro-credentials website that's only for higher education and only for universities, not for private providers. So ETECA now is lobbying the government to de-invest from the, from the micro-credentials platform. I just want to make sure I haven't left anything out because I tend to. Um, oh, and better, better entry and exit points. So then again, that's something that fixated us a bit on the, on the um, AQF review, and I can talk endlessly about the AQF review if you want me to. Um, at the moment, we've got, a, we've got a qualifications framework that ties everything to a knowledge hierarchy, from bad certificate one to very good um, higher education uh, doctorate level 10. Um, we need to try and break that nexus about knowledge being the, the determiner De determinator of, of everything that is, that is valuable. Um, and we need to enable that um, taking, that portability and the, trans and the transparency around whatever learning um, citizens are, are acquiring um, and take it with them and move on to the next stage of their life. So that was a pretty comprehensive answer. <laughs> I made a list. And you know, I, I, think, I think it's good and I, I want, but for the first time, I want to ask you another question because to me, one of the 
things you're asking for is a strategy and a framework and an agreement on the currency. But one of the challenges that I see, and I don't know the way around it, but I'm going to put it to you, is that micro-credentials and short courses are a little bit like items taken out during Antiques Roadshow. No one quite knows what each one is worth. Mm. Uh, so, you know, if you do a course at UNSW, we have them for new staff. We have a lot of short courses for new staff. We have short courses for um, education. Uh, we have short courses about research, animal ethics and things. You know, we've got various short courses and we've got courses that we teach in IT um, and we've got some courses in business leadership and things. But the smaller the course is, the harder it is to actually get that common currency and to actually fit it into the AQF. I sort of get that it would be great if you could fit them into the AQF, but I don't, I see there's a problem with defining a, foreign, a, a common currency. Do you see that as a problem? How are we gonna get past that? So we got lots of good self-serving advice on the AQF review um, from, uh, from organisations that were doing short courses on micro-credentials very well, who of course didn't want the AQF or anyone to go anywhere near that because, you know, preserve their competitor advantage. And then others that were thinking a little bit more broadly and perhaps a little bit more nation building in the utopian sense. Um, the recommendation from the panel was not to bring micro-credentials within, within the Australian Qualifications yep. Framework because they could go across a range of, a, a range of um, levels or bands as we were going to call them to try and move away from the hierarchical notion. We determined that there was guidance needed. Um, that came later, but, it, but that's happened. What hasn't happened is the national credit point system, some sort of current, some sort of st stabilised currency that you can, that, 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 that you can um, um, trade and you can say, well, this is, you know, a quarter of a subject or half a, or half a year or whatever. Um, you know, listening to Andrew talking about the, the flatlining of postgraduate um, entry, um, um, engagement in, in, in the formal credentials, you wonder whether a lot of the, what Alpha Beta says is the, the third of the, the, the new third of learning that everyone's going to have to do over their lifetime, whether they're doing that in the workplace or through online. I mean, I look at my kids now, you know, the washing machine breaks and Philip's off sailing, so my 30-year-old Grace comes over and looks at a YouTube video and fixes it. Yeah. <laughs> um, who's not an engineer to be compared with all the rest of the family who are, uh, except for me, I'm a lawyer, We're useless. Um, but I, I wonder whether that's happening and, and do people want to stack credentials because that's what we imagine that they want to do or do they just want to do the, 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 short, the short bite pieces? I was following the European First Year Experience Conference that was just held um, in, in Scotland over the last few days they have micro-credentials for their first year students to try and do all that stuff that we know is so important to get, to get them into the, the habits and the studies and the ways of learning. Um, so there's a, there's a parallel rung of, of micro-credentials. What, what we need, I think, is a clear articulation in, I would say, a lifelong learning strategy because there's so much misinformation out there about it, you know, you're going to have 13 lives, so you know, you better start getting your shopper dock at micro credential for cyber security for two hours on a Saturday afternoon. What we need to be able to articulate is at the entry level, you will need some form of qualification, be it um, vocational or higher education. I'll allow, because I'm gracious, an industry qualification as well, that could be an entry level qualification, but then you get on the treadmill of constant up and, uh, up and reskilling, and it would be nice to have a lifelong learning entitlement to allow that to be funded appropriately and some sort of lifelong learning account that could aggregate that knowledge and then imagining that there was a, um, an, a, a capability for um, metacognition and reflection around where your gaps are, then you could see how that would go. Yeah, and so yeah, I can see that yeah, I mean, that is the, the destination that many people want to go to. So, thanks. So now I'll come to you, Mark. Um, so, Mark, you've worked, you worked at UNSW for many years, and now you're at Newcastle, and they're both um, universities which are engineers. 
engineering is you know, very much in the culture and things. But I want to ask you, beyond engineering, I think the contribution that Newcastle particularly makes is a contribution, and Sally's talking about this a bit, about inclusivity in society. That it's, that I think Australia has done this well, and you know, the data Andrew showed, I think one of the biggest contributions university makes is providing inclusion and cohesion and people being invested in a system that they feel that they that it might work for them if they just you know continue working and being good citizens it'll work for them and you don't want one of these you know societies where there's an elite that has everything and everyone else is excluded so in the future and you know with your experience like what do you think we need to do about inclusion is it realistic? I mean, Sally mentioned 80% of people finish the HSC. The question of whether that's good or bad is, you know, I think is slightly more open. I mean, it's ideally... That's, that's not ATAR, just finished year 12. Yeah. It's better than it was. Anyway, you know, where should we be in inclusion? Should everyone be... Should universities be offering TAFE courses? Things like that. What's your, what's your view about the, ultimate, the end game? Or do you think it's going to plateau you know, at some stage. Thanks very much, Merlin. It's great to see um, familiar faces out there who haven't sort of jumped in and interrupted me yet. <laughs> um, listen, this is a, a really interesting question. Various people say the numbers, but basically the situation is that predictions in the future is that at least 50% of the Australian workforce is going to need a, a higher education qualification of some form. And currently it sits at about 41%. And the, the challenge is that we're not going to get that extra nine from more of the people that we've currently got in universities like UNSW. We're going to have to get it from the people who don't enter higher education. And I've sort of had a very interesting experience, and I'll share it here, that I mean, I sort of saw this, saw this coming. I mean, when I was in engineering, Merlin made a, a joke about us trying to get in more engineers into engineering. The, the driver behind that was that immigration was satisfying half the workforce yeah. needs in Australia and that is an, was, has subsequently been proven to be an unsustainable model in a range of areas. Healthcare is another one. And so we need to essentially do more education of the, of the people we've got. Now, I started off my, my journey in this, well, we just need to go to those universities that are to sort of are struggling and provide a better quality education and everyone will come and it'll solve the problem. And What's a really interesting things are, are happening? Um, the New South Wales Auditor General report came out a couple of weeks ago and showed that the number of people who are entering university in New South Wales is dropping by, I think, well over 10,000 um, between 21 and 22. That's entering higher education. That is at the same time is that the population that's been the Costello baby boomers who can enter university has actually gone up. So we have a, a really significant part of our population is not entering university at the same time as we think we need more people actually graduating from university. So you need to ask the question, well, why aren't they going to university? And we've been going through an exercise recently. We recruit students in and we find they start and they, and they drop out. And so we've been asking them, we contact all of the ones who have decided not to continue or very often they've enrolled full time and they've dropped back to half time or something like that. And what comes through is um, number one is um, health issues, actually health issues and money and financial situation are the two reasons that they are, are dropping out um, or reducing their load. Acad what the quality of what they're being delivered, the academic program is a very distant third so what we've got here is a large part of the population who is capable of doing higher education, but they're not finding it accessible. They need to work, they've got family pressures, etc. At the same time as we've got this really big cohort, which, which Sally also mentioned, have decided at the moment not to enter university. So I, if, if you look forward 30 years, we need to have a, a way for that cohort to actually enter higher education. So what that means is we really need to create a, an education which is attractive to those people to come in and actually stay. This is really, really challenging. 
Um, because what we've got is that people who didn't go into university initially, they've gone out and got a job, they've got a relationship, they might have got a mortgage. The standard three or four year full-time undergraduate degree is really not going to work for them. They've got too many other, other commitments. You, and you can see this is happening again and again, particularly when you realise that a large part of these people, their parents or their family didn't go to university. Um, and the job market has been reasonably strong at the moment. Um, I was, each morning I go down to the beach and have a swim. I went down this morning, it was sort of bracing. But as I came out, there was a young guy who I'd seen um, around the place. And I just sat there, I was having a coffee and ended up chatting. He came out with his surfboard. And he dropped out of um, high school this year through the course of year 12. And basically, he'd got a job as a builder's labourer. He was earning nearly $1,000 a week as a builder's labourer. His parents didn't go to university. They said, well, it seems to be working for you. Don't worry about it. Um, he'd bought himself a ute and he had his surfboard and he was in heaven. <laughs> and, and, but this is not something that... And there's a lot of people like that and it can't be sustainable. So we need to come to a situation. How do we make this attractive? And then people sort of immediately dive to, to micro-credentials. I think all of those in, in education will realise if you've dropped out of education sometime around year 11 and 12, suddenly jumping back in and doing something and for sort of some block of time, which is less than a full course, a full course subject at the moment, is not going to get there. There has to be a structure and a scaffolding around it. But we need to make it relevant. So what we've got is a population who currently go to university, by and large, particularly the top universities, who they're, they're basically they're in reasonably solid financial situation. Half the reason that they're probably going there is for sort of social interaction, their friends are doing it. Whereas the people that are not going to university are very, they want to, they're going to be in a profession, they want to get a better job, they want to do things better. And that doesn't necessarily equate to a standard degree. So what we need to do is start creating educational products which are very flexible. And we talked about the sort of check in, check out. I think that the required prior learning piece is actually going to be really significant. Getting into any university in Australia where you've half completed a couple of courses here and there and you've had work experience for two years is a very complicated process. Um, it's quite difficult to actually do it. And it was interesting that the sort of the, we had this AI discussion initially. I think what we're doing at the moment is starting to use artificial intelligence tools. We've linked up with a couple of companies where we can start building databases of previous qualifications that, or previous experience that people have so that the next student who comes in with a similar application, we can effectively say a similar profile or not so similar, we can actually put them into a, into a program in a particular place. But at the same time, you then start having to start having to have um, Sally's multiple exit points. And this is where the, the employer piece comes in. Because if we're wearing, wanting people to actually get a qualification so it suits their job, at the moment, the, it's not a particularly strong connection between, between the actual university qualification you get, which is a standard degree, and the particular job that you're going to get. But that's got to change. And this is the other piece that I think actually AI will make a big change because we're going to start being able to develop database bases where skill needs for particular jobs become a lot more granular. At the moment, to go out and become a doctor, you need a doctor's degree with a particular certificate. And the medical, sort of the doctor ed medical educators for a long time have been worried that the people they're graduating are not actually, haven't got all the skills to be a doctor. But if we can set this up, it's a lot better. So I actually think the university moving forward, we've got to get more people into the system. We won't get more people into the system by just continuing to deliver what we've got. And it has to be something which is tailored to people who have lots of other things in their lives but, but want to get a qualification. And the model that I'm putting forward is one where it is actually, uh, that one can see what you need to do to actually get to this particular direction. And I think it is a real challenge for the AQF because the AQF is essentially structured around this, do this, you get this, do this, you get that. Um, and perhaps we can blend the two together, but I think we need to be training the, our workforce or potential workforce to actually satisfy the country's needs and that is not going to be done by getting more people into the standard degrees which we're currently teaching. 
Yeah, I think I think that's right. I mean, I think Andrew Norton showed slides where you know over the last thirty years we've done a, a good job getting people's school leavers in and and reaching across society. But you're right, there are people who are still excluded, and we need to have new mechanisms. And I think that's great. If you know the guy you met in the surfboard. You know he's doing well now, but we don't want him to feel excluded in ten years' time, and he may he may be. But I want to um, switch now. We've talked about students, uh, we've talked about our society, we've talked about changes in technologies. I want to actually talk about academic staff in a way. And one of the themes we we sort of brainstormed th themes, and one of the brainstormed, and one of the uh, themes is the workforce needs, and. So if I ask you, Sarah, you know, what will the future university workplace look like? What do you think the academics of the future? And yeah, you, everyone can answer slightly different questions by all means. But you know, for academics, what's the future going to be like for academics? Is it what their future will be like or what their composition will be like? Well, I, whichever that... you prefer. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, Look, uh, from coming from my previous institute here to UNSW where there's education focused roles, I think that's already been something, that, you know, there's a lot of universities that do that. So it's thinking about what is the skill set of the academic and what is the academic of the future. So, you know, traditionally we expect academics to basically be a bit all singing, all dancing. They're doing research, they're doing te teaching, they're doing engagement and leadership. Um, and in general, and that's in your portfolios for your promotions, um, and there are certainly some academics that are fabulous at all three and enjoy all three, but they're probably few and far between. Um, usually you love and do well in one of the portfolios and ideally a couple of them. So I suppose the question is how do we, how do we split that up? Do we need to split that workforce up more? Would that make life easier for the academics? But going to the broader conversations, if, we're, if universities are really going to embrace lifelong learning, the other thing we didn't really talk about in terms of that flexibility and um, reaching out to different cohorts is also online, so fully online versus, which gives a level of flexibility to people from different locations and potentially being able to dip in and out. So are those teaching skills of teaching face-to-face -face and teaching online, are they identical or not? It's a question. And are they sort of different cohorts? So I think it'll be interesting to see the actual composition of the academics um, and sort of being able to support what it is that academics want and also understanding that students' needs are also going to change. So they might need different types of teachers at different parts of, of their learning journey. Um, and then I think also to, you know, we, we talk really about higher ed, but don't forget there are actually dual sector institutes already, and I came from one of those. Um, so that's sort of, uh, while they are siloed, I agree, Sally, um, there can be sort of permeability between the two, and that's something that we also need to think about. And they, they teach in very different ways, because there's competency-based teaching in vocational, um, which is quite different to higher education. So as we think of some of these broader questions about flexibility for students, but also the really changing nature of what the um, workforce needs and what industry needs and what people want as they potentially dip in and out. The actual workforce of the academic could change quite a bit, I think. I mean, I think, I think you're right, it will change, but I, uh, you know, looking at Andrew's figures and stuff, I think there'll still be a lot of work for us to do, and particularly if we expand the student base to be more inclusive. So my clock says we've got quite a lot of uh, time left, and the panel's aware of that. But I've actually looked at a new clock, which has just been brought up to me, and we have less time left. <laughs> we only have five minutes or so. So there are some questions from the floor from Slido, perhaps from the people, uh, the virtual people online. Uh, and I'll throw to Theo. This is a good question. What has been higher education's biggest success and failure? Okay, wow. And I'll have to do that in a couple of minutes. Okay. Um, uh, look, uh, and I think Andrew's, uh, Andrew's slides really data rich, really, those slides are all about success, about increasing access, offering higher education to many, many more people, offering much more opportunity. Um, I think the growth of the university sector in Australia is a success story. Um, I'm one of these people that actually, on this kind of debate around shouldn't there be more diversity in Australia, I'm not convinced that, I think there's piles of diversity in the universities. They kind of look the same, but in reality there's quite a bit of diversity inside them. But the fact that they offer uh, education in a broad range of disciplines, that, that most of them mix research and have 
some deep areas, every university has deep areas of research strengths, uh, which then leverage into teaching, and, and that, those are all strengths. And of course, the QS rankings, from an Australian point of view, point to the immense success of the Australian higher education sector. And that's even before we start talking about, um, other, uh, you know, higher education is the largest service-based export in Australia. So Australia higher education is just success story after success story. Um, but there's more that we can do, uh, and, and we know it already. Like, we can see, when we look at the statistics since Bradley, what we can see is great success in, in increasing um, access to higher education for people with disabilities, uh, but not much improvement in terms of uh, people from low socioeconomic backgrounds. So there's clearly more that needs to be done around improving access to higher education for people from low economic um, um, backgrounds. Uh, we've seen improvement in uh, access to higher education for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander persons, uh, but what we're seeing is we're not seeing enough improvement in terms of, of their progression. And so we're seeing much higher levels of attrition for um, people from a First Nations background. So we can see in these areas where we need to improve. But I basically think in terms of, so I don't think there's been many failures, but I think there are challenges ahead. I think before COVID there was a failure in that we hadn't digitally transformed enough actually, but now we've caught up. Uh, but I think the challenge before us will be the risk that once again a gap will open between us and every other sector in the economy. Like, so in every, in every company now, this, the top question that every board is asking in every company, slight exaggeration but only slight, is how can we leverage AI to transform our business model? And that is going to power major change in all the sectors around us. And the risk is that we won't have the resources or we won't have the agility to actually embrace that and once again we see that gap opening. So we could be having a conversation in 10 years' time about our greatest failure, and I could be saying, like I told you about AI, didn't I? But right now, I think for the sector, it's a story of immense success. Yeah, I think that's, I think it's a good answer. I mean, you know, success, but we have, we've got, still got work to do. I think the other failure people would say is that we haven't connected to industry enough, but I think that that's partly a result of the structure of Australian industries and, uh, you know, and we're working on it. There's a lot of things. So again, we're doing it. So look, Sally, a question's come through, which is an interesting one. I don't know if it's fair. I think it's, it's fine. It's just, you know, what is the things that are, um, what's a unique success of Australian universities and what can we learn from universities overseas? You know, I, I think that's sort of an interesting question. Are we different from universities overseas? I think they have them overseas. Um, <laughs> Look, I think it's the sharing practice um, and collaboration. So, so, you know, so I'm unemployed. <laughs> I do a lot of pro bono stuff. Um, I'm, for my, you know, great good fortune, am in a global forum for student success, um, which is just a grand name for like-minded people that are trying to share good practice internationally and what we can learn from each other about that. So I would bring a curriculum perspective on that. I think, I think you know, one of the ways we... Access is one thing about equity groups, getting yeah. them into higher education, but what we haven't fundamentally changed is the environment in which we put them then um, and, and how we speak to their lived experience and make them feel included, belonged, uh, uh, that they matter and that they're valued and, and get that sense of belonging. So, so that's, the con that's the international conversation I'm having with amazing people from Colombia, from um, the US, from the UK, about what we can share from, from those different perspectives. Um, I actually think Australian higher education, the quality of Australian higher education is, is really very good. In, in, my, in my discipline of law, which I share with Alex, um, when I, I look at countries other than Australia, as Sean McAuliffe would say, um, and I think, you know, mm, I'm, glad, I'm glad we learnt it here rather than there. So obviously there's things to learn and different, so that's about the best I can do with that, with, yeah, with that So question. you also work on larceny? Do Sorry? You, do you still work on larceny, like Alex? Oh, no, no I don't do larceny. <laughs> or just criminal law. But, yeah, yeah I think... I yeah, I actually think... I was glad... I didn't know if anyone would mention the rankings, but I'm glad when Theo mentioned them. That, uh, that you know, I think Australians are very modest when it comes to intellectual achievements, but our universities are extremely efficient and extremely high quality. They attract staff and students from across the world, 
and I think we do well per dollar. The, you know, the outputs per dollar are very good. I think we're very well placed in the Asian century with certain you know, Western cultural foundations, but we're alert to the sense of innovation and hunger and, and yeah, uh, industry in Asia. I think we do pretty well. I think the biggest challenge, we've got the scale of what we do. You know, our universities are so big. It's hard to give students a personalised experience. We try very hard, and I think they get it by the end of their degree, but I'm not sure they always get it by first year. So look, I think I should give one last question to um, Mark Hoffman. It's an interesting question, Mark. How has your experience in higher ed changed the way you learn and think? Yes, very interesting question. <laughs> I think it's my experience as I suppose going through on the on the journey when I compare it to people who haven't had a higher ed experience is you start becoming a lot more receptive to to new ideas to new perspectives um, you're always looking for, 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 for new challenges I suppose and when I reflect on what I see here just following on from the previous theme in Australia it's probably also one of our our greatest challenges and we mentioned I think we need to integrate more with industry I think there is a danger that the higher higher education and universities separate themselves a bit from society um, it's it's particularly interesting to see that the the experience of most of society and most of our politicians etc of university is when they were a student there's not as good integration between what happens within universities and the broader um, society. I often used to get quite, become, feel, feel quite challenged. I am sort of, actually I'm at the moment, where you've got all of the universities as more or less of going out supporting the voice, for example. But it's sort of, the numbers are saying that half the population does not, or more than, we're in a bit of a balance at the moment. And whatever you think of that, it means that there's a difference in thinking between what's happening in universities and what's happening in society. And I think we can find it come across a lot of issues like this. Um, now, it's, but we like to see ourselves as leading in society. So I think this is one thing that sort of I've learnt, I think particularly as you move around different universities in different parts of the country that, and go overseas, is this, this ability to actually not just lead society by being the, the, the university, but actually being a part of society. And I think that's something that I'm seeing more and more in the, in the higher education sector, that we, we, need to, we need to really think about that and reflect on it, that we do wish to be leaders, but you need to be careful that you're not too far away from who you're trying to lead. Yeah, I think that's a great way to end. So thank you, Mark. So I now just have the job of um, closing up and um, holding you up for a few minutes until the second round of drinks and nibbles which will be available and networking. So what I'd say is, you know, Mark's comments there about universities and a cohesive society, universities, integration, society, uh, I think are enormously important. I actually think that universities play an enormous role in this, but I absolutely believe that a lot of society thinks that we're uh, uh, on another planet. Uh, but I'd also say that within universities, uh, we're free thinkers and often there are big divides within universities. This is particularly true in research. I mean, Theo mentioned it. We all have to, if you're going to specialise in research, you have to be specialist. And in, in a research area, often your closest colleagues and friends are in another university across the world that specialises in the same area as you do. But that is not true in teaching. In teaching and in administration, we can form bonds, understanding, have debates uh, across the university. And that's why I think events like this, in person or face-to-face, -face, are enormously important. I think building a university community is hugely important. Whenever you say anything at a university, we're trained to disagree with things, and, and there'll always be a diversity of opinion. But it forms bonds by having these things. So I'm enormously important, uh, grateful to the Scientia Education Academy, which has worked across UNSW 
connecting people and leading in thought leadership about university teaching, education, the future, and how to manage the careers and how to support our students. I'm grateful to uh, the education focus community at UNSW that's had a transformative impact on, I think, our, our staff, our collegiality, and our students. I want to particularly call out Nalini, uh, uh, Patha, and Patsy Polly, who you know brainstormed this, and without them, we wouldn't have this. But also other people, uh, Dorota, Remy, Laura, who uh, were in the planning, and I want to recognise Louise Lutzman and uh, Alex Steele, who've you know, been guiding lights. Both of them are actually among our most dedicated, inspiring, and impactful teachers. And the impact that teachers have on society is much greater often than the individual, any individual researcher's impact might be. I want to thank our guests for coming. Sally had to come down against headwinds, and Andrew had to fly up against headwinds because the, the Sydney airport was disrupted today. And I've said if they don't get a flight back, they're welcome to stay here and work for UNSW. <laughs> so with well, that, I would uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you, everyone from the sector and everyone who's interested in the sector. Please eat, drink, and be merry. Thank you.